So welcome to the uh, final, final uh, presentation of the Marine Surveying International Fest Edition 2 for commercial ship surveyors. Uh, delighted to welcome Graham Haynes, um, Business Development Director of Cygnus, Cygnus Instruments. Um, uh, we regard Graham as a friend and uh, we do work quite closely together on all sorts of things. I'm grateful uh, to Cygnus for the contribution at events like this and for also putting a few pennies into our coffers so that we can promote you to our membership and so on. So I know there's um, a lot happening as technology changes and uh, I'm quite interested to see what the uh, update is on hatch cover testing equipment. So without further ado, Graham, it's uh, over to you. Mike, okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yes, we're, we're going to have a, a run through um, the latest multi-mode thickness gauges what, what I'd like to show you is the, is the latest features, really, that Cygnus have on their range of surface thickness gauges. What I'm going to aim to do is to spend about 30 minutes um, on thickness gauges, and then the remaining 15 minutes, really just for the highlights of our um, hatch cover tester. So primarily we're, we'll focus on on the current range, we call them Mark V range of, of thickness gauges and then move on to hatch cover testing. Okay, here we go then. So I think uh, for, for everybody watching, I imagine the majority of you have a, a fairly good idea of what an ultrasonic thickness gauge does. We're, we're primarily wanting to measure the thickness of steel um, from one side and um, if we can do it without removing protective coatings, so much the better. So back in the early 1980s, Cygnus developed a, 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 a digital uh, technique using um, multiple echoes for ultrasonic thickness gauging. This was um, uh, quite revolutionary in its time, and um, it meant you didn't need to use uh, floor detectors where you had to back off the first and second echoes and so you could ignore coatings. Uh, and it was uh, engineered into a, a digital handheld device. So generally speaking, in ultrasonic thickness gauging, there are three methods of obtaining a thickness measurement. We can either use um, a single pulse of sound. So with a single pulse of sound, let me just turn on my pointer, here we go. So with a single pulse of sound, um, a single echo thickness gauge or pitch catch gauge as they're referred as, that will just use one pulse of sound through the material through whatever coating or whatever on the surface, and we're looking just to grab one returning echo. We can then um, use two pulses of sound with, um, and, and, and look at the, the two returning echoes, and this technique is referred to uh, echo echo. And then three pulses, where we tend to refer to that as multiple echo or triple echo. So in the marine and shipping industry for many years, the multiple echo technique has been favorite and it's been specified by many classification societies for where thickness measurements need to be taken through protective coatings. And it served us very well. But what I'm just going to show you where some limitations can come into play and where we can hopefully offer some solutions. So we'll go on to the next slide. So quick, this isn't scotch by the way, green tea. So a quick look at the multiple echo technique. So the multiple echo technique uses a single crystal probe and it uses a straight beam of sound transmits the ultrasound from the probe through the material, hits the back wall and bounces back. And the instrument's calibrated for the velocity of sound through that material and it can then calculate um, how thick it is. So it's really a, a, a 
precision timing device, really. So the clever bit comes in um, ignoring the coating. So this, uh, this diagram, again, it shows a multiple echo. So we've got a, a string of echoes that we've stretched out really along the x-axis. And what we're looking for is, here's the, the transmission ping through the, through the, the material. This is a, a coating, and here's our steel, the, the sort of more gray color. So the ultrasound travels through the, the steel, hits the back wall, returns back. Some of the sound uh, exits through the coating and the rest of the sound continues through the, the steel. Now, what we want to do here, we want to ignore this first echo because the transit time is traveling through the, the paint or coating at approximately 2,000 meters per second. And the instrument will be calibrated for steel, which is textbook figure is 5,920. So let's say, roughly speaking, 6,000 meters per second. So the sound travels through, through the steel, hits the back wall, comes back. Now, what we want to do is to ignore this transit time through the coating. So we want the, the, the instrument to start timing here. So we ignore all this first echo. And then the gauge captures the second echo and the third echo. And this is effectively just the timing through the steel. Uh, really a very, very nice technique. It uses a straight beam of ultrasound. And we'll come on to B beam and, and that sort of thing in, in a moment, but it uses a straight beam, which is, is really the, the nicest way of, of doing things. And it has to match these two echoes, the second and third echo, they have to be identically matched before the instrument gives a reading. So our philosophy is, and always has been, multiple echo um, technique. We would always recommend that the multiple echo technique is used wherever possible. And the wherever possible is um, where the the, the areas where it's not possible, I should say really, is where we'll actually move into next. So next slide. So still staying with multiple echo for a moment. What we provide are some echo strength bars or, or a, a rather not so much strength, but how many echoes the gauge is seeing. So if, we, if you're trying to get a measurement and you're on poorly corroded steel, pitted, this sort of thing. The worst situation you can get into is when you see this. One bar, nothing else, no matter how you turn the probe, how you rock the probe, how hard you bash the, the, the steel with your hammer, it's very difficult to try and get a reading. If you get two bars up, we're basically saying that the, that the instrument has detected one returning echo. If you get three bars up, we've got two echoes detected. And if we've got four bars up, we're showing that we've got three returning echoes, but they're not matched. So very often when you get this sort of uh, condition, this is when by some gentle rocking of the probe, then you can get the echoes to match up and then you'll reading will, will appear. So to go about this, we have a, a range of different probes. Uh, for standard uh, marine type work, we almost always recommend a two and a quarter megahertz probe. Uh, we call it our S2C, single crystal, two megahertz. Um, C is the, the size. So this is a very standard probe used all over the world, especially in, in the marine industry. There is a, a larger cousin of it, but that's a, a larger diameter. Um, we really don't sell too many of these, these probes these days. It's generally thought that they can help through very thick coatings because you've got a bigger crystal. 
um, larger diameter, but this larger di diameter does throw up some disadvantages as well. There are um, smaller uh, five megahertz, um, uh, uh, ideal for sort of pipes and, and, and that sort of thing, boiler tubes maybe. And then there's a 30 millimeter five megs and a 3.5. The 3.5 is quite useful for small steel vessels where the steel doesn't start off life um, too thick you know, maybe um, barges, that sort of thing, where maybe the steel is only about six millimeters from when it's new. And uh, what with erosion and corrosion, uh, and you want to see measurements down to two millimeters. So this is quite an effective probe on smaller steel craft. Okay. <clears throat> So, as I said, where we need to see three returning echoes, and we have to match the second and third echo, that's all, all very, very good when the steel is moderately corroded and not in a horrendous state. But if you take something like this, this is actually part of a, a, a pipe section here, and this is hydrogen blistering on the inside of the pipe. Uh, the returning echoes from something like that make it really quite difficult for the multiple echo technique to be able to get uh, uh, measurements at all. So the returning echoes, the, the, the front face of this pipe, we can't see it here, it's, it's actually pretty good condition. In fact, it's, it's fine. So the ultrasound will travel through, hit all this blistering and, and, and pitting, and then the returning echoes basically do a starburst and they come back at all different times of flight. And the instrument's looking at all these returning echoes and trying to match the second and third echo and um, can have a hard time of it. So this is where we, with our latest range of Mark V gauges, which have been on the market for about like four years or so, I suppose now, is where we've introduced the single echo and echo echo technique using twin crystal probes. So not only for applications like this, but also for marine industry where corrosion can be extremely bad in some areas. And it's not always possible to take a thickness measurement where you're supposed to take a thickness measurement. And people tend to work around and try and take a measurement wherever they can so um, we can we can offer a, a better solution for this now so we'll have a look at single echo first so the single echo here is just one pulse of sound you're transmitting it's traveling through the steel coming back and we're grabbing it Historically, there have been and there still are uh, a lot of instruments that in single echo that can give some pretty poor measurements. Um, random number generators, maybe, uh, and certainly not to be recommended. The, to use a single echo gauge like this on corrosion applications, you then really need a twin crystal probe. So instead of one crystal, a single crystal that transmits and receives the, the ultrasound, the twin crystal probe is divided in half. So you've got one half that's transmitting and the other half that's listening. So while a single crystal probe transmits, stops, listens, transmits, stops, listens. The twin crystal probe is transmitting all the time and the receiving side is listening all the time. Okay. So what we can see here now, the crystals up in the inside, up, up behind the delay line, uh, will actually be angled. And this is done uh, deliberately so that you have a very focused beam of ultrasound. 
from a single crystal probe, you tend to get more of a sort of a beam shape. So the back wall of the steel will have a spot of ultrasound. With a twin crystal probe, the, the, the focus is, is a directed more towards a, a pinpoint. So when you're looking at pits and general corrosion on the back wall of the, of the, uh, of the steel, then this can uh, be an advantage. The V-beam, of course, um, because if we literally took the timing from the transmission pulse to uh, the receiver picking up here, um, this would not give you the correct distance of the thickness of steel because it's not in a straight line. Now, this V-beam correction is calculated uh, within the electronics and um, really taken care of very well. These latest gauges, they, you do have to zero a probe, a uh, twin crystal probe, but years ago you used to have these little steel plates fitted to the front of the, of the gauge for zeroing the probe. Uh, this is all done electronically now. All you have to do is press a button and the probe will be zeroed. Um, this is actually showing um, um, a pretty rotten piece of pipe work here uh, with a fairly small diameter probe. Um, this sort of thing would be pretty tricky to try and get uh, a reading using multiple echo. So now um, we'll have a look at echo echo. So echo echo is is basically again what what it says we're using two pulses of sound the first pulse and it's showing here going through a coating so the same as really is multiple echo except we we've, we've only got two and not not three echoes here so you'll see the first echo t1 is is much longer because we're going slowly through the coating and coming through the steel and back out through the coating so this is the, the reading we want here, just on echo two. So this technique allows you to ignore fairly thin coatings, um, but if you've got bad back wall here, you can get good measurements. So with the twin crystal probes, we have, um, three, uh, actually there's, there's a, an, another one on here, there's another five meg one that we're not actually showing on this PowerPoint. So there's a, a, a two megahertz twin, a five megahertz twin, and a 7.5, this one here. But for general marine type general work, then this T5B is really excellent probe. This is all in stainless steel housing again. And this is a, a composite probe. Um, so a composite probe offers far more output than a standard monolithic probe. So, so this is really quite a, quite a, a pokey probe um, for all sorts of measuring applications. You can see the sort of measuring range that you've got here, two to 200. But we'll come on to Echo Echo in a sec. This does, is severely limited when you um, move to echo echo, you can only measure down to four millimeter, four millimeter and a maximum of 25 millimeter. But again, uh, generally, generally speaking for a, a lot of marine work, probably fine. Now, when Cygnus introduced the Mark V range and we wanted to introduce single echo and echo echo measuring modes we very much understand the reluctance of some surveyors not wanting to use single echo um, and there have been a few horror stories over the years and people just getting completely wrong measurements so we developed what we call the measurement stability indicator technique with MSI. So what we're actually doing here in single echo and echo echo mode 
we take eight returning echoes over a two second period. So if the instrument, you're taking the measurement, eight returning echoes, there and back, there and back, there and back, eight times over a two second period. And if all those returning echoes are the same, then there's a much higher probability that the measurement you're getting is, is true and accurate. So this is a good attempt, I think, of bringing uh, single echo and echo echo measurements into something in a similar sort of field of being able to have a, a high level of confidence of the, of the reading that you're getting. Let me show you how this happens. So um, this is looking at the display on either our four plus or six plus uh, gauges. So you put the probe on and the measurement is displayed. So we're seeing 8.3 millimeters. After a two second period, the display will change green. If it doesn't change green, then it means that the instrument cannot match these eight returning echoes over a two second period. Um, it will actually, uh, these gauges actually have a vibrate feature as well. So the, 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 when, when the MSI has been, uh, and the, um, has been matched, then um, the, the gauge will vibrate, the display will change, and um, you've got a, a really good chance that this is a, a good measurement. And this can be on corroded steel that you probably thought was virtually impossible to measure before. Our Cygnus 2 model doesn't have the LCD display like, uh, like we just looked at. So the Cygnus 2 on the end mounted display, the display changes from this hollow to a solid. And again, um, that will then tell you if, the, uh, if, if MSI has been uh, successful. Okay, so advantages and disadvantages. So advantages of single echo, we've got a focused beam path concentrating ultrasound energy in a smaller area. Remember we looked at the V-beam and we're, we're focusing ultrasound on the back wall exactly where we want to put it, not scattered across a, an, an area. As, as we would do with a, a, a single element probe. Where it's difficult to get strong returning echoes on extreme front and back wall corrosion, the worse the front wall and the, uh, and the more corroded and pitted the back wall, the signal amplitude decreases dramatically. And this is again, what can lead to difficulties in getting measurements sometimes. Um, we have, put here on specific shapes and non-parallel faces. That's true to, uh, to, to an extent, but um, generally speaking, uh, even in single echo, you do need um, reasonably parallel faces, but, but you, a bit more latitude really in single echo than, uh, than multiple echo. So the disadvantages, <clears throat> you can't measure through coatings. You have to remove coatings. Um, you will measure the thickness of the couplant because the single echo technique will just travel through the couplant and it will treat it like a coating. So this is something that you just cannot be avoided um, in single echo. Uh, and even because we offer these techniques with our underwater instruments now with things like um, pilings, inshore pilings that tend to get extremely heavily corroded and uh, quite difficult to measure sometimes in multiple echo. But there's, so there's a few things that one has to take on board here. If you're, if you're underwater and the probe is over a pit and you've got water in the pit, you will measure the, effectively the thickness of the water. So a uh, quick look at our um, plus models. 
So the Mark V range has actually uh, five models in it. So there's a standard Cygnus II and a standard Cygnus IV, multiple echo only. And then we have the plus models. So the two plus and the four plus and the six plus. So all of these gauges are all multi-mode. They all have the capability of using single echo, echo echo, multiple echo, and they can be used with single crystal probes and twin crystal probes. So quite a bit of uh, flexibility there now. When you use the, a certain type of probe, and sh let's say for instance, you have a uh, S2C, a two and a quarter meg single crystal probe, and you have a T5B in your toolkit. When you set these probes up, the, the gauge will remember um, the, 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 the measuring mode that the probe was used in, what units, that's in, in, uh, metric and, and, uh, and um, imperial, what resolution it was set up, the velocity of sign, the calibration, um, and we, do, we have this deep coat mode as well to measure through very thick coatings. So as soon as you swap the probe over, it will remember those things. If you want to change them, it's easy enough to do, you can just change them. Now on the four plus and six plus models that have the uh, front facing LCD display, we also have the option of having a scan. Now, the A scan gives you a graphical representation of the returning echoes. And if we look here along the x axis here, this is set from zero to 55 millimeters, that's the range. The measurement we're seeing here is 25.6. And this is the echo, and this little black up, uh, triangle here is, is indicating the returning echo that we're picking up on for our measurement. Um, in a lot of industries now, uh, it's mandatory to use an A-scan thickness gauge, uh, and more and more um, people are looking at A-scan. A what A-Scan helps to give you is further verification that you are truly looking at the back wall and not some delamination or defect that you may otherwise be picking up on. The, the big advantage, especially if you, if you data log and store these readings, is if somebody asks you in a year's time, should we say, those readings you took on such and such a vessel or whatever you're working on, were, were they actually correct? Um, so with the, with the possibility of being able to offer an A-scan display as well, it does give further verification that these, these measurements were backed up properly with a, with, with a true A-scan display. Okay. Um, so the A-scan really, th this is what you would see on an oscilloscope. <clears throat> it all looks a bit messy and what have you, but what people in the thickness gauging business and, and general UT and DT business do, um, it's actually rectified. So all the negative peaks are taken away and then you see a, a far more simpler uh, uh, display here. So what we're actually looking at, these, these echoes in between are what they call mode conversion echoes. Um, can't be helped really with twin crystal probes, unfortunately. They're the returning, egg transmitting echoes and returning echoes from the far edges of, of the crystal. But we can clearly see here a very strong signal. This is the next echo here. So again, another, we've got a range of zero to 20 and 8.3. So we can see that the measurement we're picking up here, if that's uh, 10 millimeters in the middle, so about eight millimeters here. So that's, that's the, a nice strong echo 
and the pointer here is actually on the flank of the largest peak. The um, A scan is useful in echo echo. I'm trying to show here. Yeah, that's really just much the same. It's, so wh where the A scan can be particularly useful, if we're looking at very weak ultrasound signals, so there's no correct back wall here, the instrument can't see this. So this sort of turns the lights on really. Uh, you can actually see the returning echoes. If you're struggling to get measurements and you haven't got an A scan, to some, to, to some extent that there's uh, some guesswork, what's going on here? Okay. Uh, in data logging, we can store all the, all the measurements and each measurement, the A scan will be stored alongside for future reference, future verification. If you're actually um, asked to produce some further evidence in your report of, of the A scans, it's all here. A um, couple of little videos here. This one just showing single echo on corrosion. Sorry. I don't think you're seeing this, are you? Just go back a second on this. No, I'm going to have to miss that one. Okay? No, I'm going to have to miss that one. Okay, um, well, that's about my 30 minutes on, on thickness gauging. Um, actually, those videos um, are on our website. There's one there showing uh, uh, taking measurements using uh, single echo, 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 through coatings in echo, echo. They're, they're all on our website if you want to take a, take a look at that. Okay. Next subject, hatch cover testing. Um, we've had our hatch shot instrument for ooh, more than 10 years now. Uh, it's been accepted very well globally and it's um, an extremely powerful instrument, I think, and I'll try and spend the next uh, 12 minutes or so, 15 minutes, just giving you a, a taste of what um, hatch cover testing is all about. So why do we check hatch covers? Well, basically to stop the ingress of uh, water, um, mainly uh, to stop damage to cargo, but also um, with vessels that carry uh, cargo like nickel, that can be, uh, if they become too wet and flooded, the whole cargo can shift and cause vessels to capsize, liquefaction. So um, to some extent, we're, we're um, asked to uh, provide instruments for this kind of inspection work, but, but mainly so that vessels are um, weather tight when they go to sea and the P&I clubs are uh, happy to issue a certificate that the vessel is seaworthy and their precious cargoes won't get damaged and insurance claims will follow. So traditionally, the, the way of checking hatch covers was, was either light testing, which is just a simple test where 
you close the hatch covers, get down in the dark hold and see if you can see any light coming in through the gaps. Not particularly scientific really. Um, chalk testing, which is still used on new build vessels. So this is where the, the sort of a chalk is applied along one surface and then the hatch covers are brought together and you can see the high spots and the low spots. And then hose testing, which is still uh, an approved IAX method of hatch cover testing, is using high pressure water jets um, to spray in and around the two halves of the hatch cover seals. Um, and basically somebody inside saying, whoa, 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 there's water coming in. So Hatshaw is a, it is a ABS class approved instrument. It's uh, ultrasonic and it can be done by a single operator. This is a transmitter. So this goes down on the tank top in the, uh, in, in the hold and this is the receiver. Our transmitter is uh, particularly powerful. We use 19 elements um, as opposed to quite a few less with, with some manufacturers. So we produce a, a lot of ultrasound here. So the method really is, well, here's, here's the hole, here's the transmitter, here's the receiver. And if we've got any leak at all, any damaged part of the seal, then the ultrasound will travel through this, this um, um, gap or damaged part of the seal, and it can be de detected up on deck with this receiver unit. So these 19 emitters all produce these omnidirectional beams of ultrasound. Uh, and what the idea is, is to give a complete full spread of ultrasound throughout the hold and fill the hole completely with ultrasound. The, this the, this uh, um, instrument can, can be used very successfully on the largest uh, bulk carriers, um, including Cape size vessels, and the holds on these things are enormous. So um, here we are, I um, mean, positioning of the transmitter on the, uh, on the tank top here. Ultrasound is bouncing away on all these hard steel surfaces, even if you have a vessel here with a tween deck so that basically you can put one cargo above and a different cargo underneath if you put this uh, uh, infill in here. But even with this, ultrasound will bounce around and fill the whole hold with, with ultrasound. So the receiver, so here's our receiver. The operator wears some, some uh, headphones, sort of neckband headphones here. And then he's got a microphone on the end of a extension, uh, telescopic extension piece. And then inside the, the hole would be the transmitter. So basically you can see here that the, the operator here, he's got, he's got his uh, receiver unit, there's a telescopic one microphone on the end of it, and then he will travel along the whole perimeter of the hold, listening for escaping ultrasound. The, this technique um, has all been adopted by classification societies, um, and it was DNV uh, a few years ago who came up with the uh, method of calculating the uh, percentage value leak before you needed to affect repairs basically. So um, very briefly what one does here, the transmitter is put down in the in the hold, uh, there is a, a remote control function, you can turn the transmitter on and off with a, a radio signal so you Go down the hold, set the transmitter up, back up on deck, hatch cover is all secured, tightened down, and then you need to calibrate the instrument so it's uh, showing 100%. Um, 
if the hatch covers are all tight, then you need to actually go uh, and do the calibration in uh, through a, an entrance hatch. If the hatch covers are open, you can calibrate it then to, so it's reading 100%, close, close, everything, close everything down. Now, when you're doing the actual survey, if you see a reading that is greater than 10%, then that means that there's a significant leak and repairs have to be effected. So you can pinpoint exactly where this leak is, produce a report, it's very repeatable, it's very easy to use. P&I clubs all accept ultrasonic hatch cover testing, as do many shipyards around the world. I'm gonna finish up my last couple of slides. So to set the open hatch value, we, we, you can either do it with a microphone, um, just with the hatch covers cracked open slightly, or you can do it in the uh, booby hatch here, or access hatch. So the advantages of ultrasonic hatch cover testing, it's reliable and accurate. There's no pollution, there's no water running everywhere off the deck of a vessel. It's okay to carry the test after the cargo's been loaded. Obviously you can't do that with, uh, with uh, hose testing. You can do it in all light conditions, sub-zero temperatures. You can't do hose testing in sub-zero temperatures. And you can also use it for uh, a bow doors, external doors, that sort of thing. Uh, I won't go through all, all these, but if you, this, is, uh, this presentation will be available through the IIMS, I know. But this actually gives you a, a little tick list of the advantages and disadvantages if you compare ultrasonic testing with um, hose testing. Um, lastly, this just shows the kit. It's all been made nice and easy, actually in a rucksack, so you can put it on your back getting on and off a vessel, uh, not in a carry case, and it all comes complete with battery charger and all, all, the, all the bits and pieces. Nice and small, you can take it on, on an aircraft, uh, no, no problem. There we are, Mike. Fabulous, thank you, Graham. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Now, what, what do these things cost, are you going to tell us? Oh, well, there's no price increase next year. That, that, that is a good thing, isn't it? That sounds very good to me. <laughs> um, the, the, the Cygnus uh, 2 and 2 Plus, the 2 Plus that has multi-mode, um, it's exactly the same price as the standard Cygnus 2. So around about 15 to 1600 pounds, depending on what probe configuration you want. The Hatshaw uh, is a little over 2000 pounds. Okay. Fabulous. I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Um, I know Graham's uh, keen to get to the office party, so I'm very grateful to you, Graham, for hanging they promise, they, they promise they'll put a beer on the counter for me, okay? Beer on the counter sounds good, and I hope you're going to change into your Christmas jumper as well. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hold your breath on that one. 